Hey, thanks for watching this week's video. Be sure to like and subscribe and hit that notification bell so you can see when a new video drops. If you live in the Okeechobee area, we would love for you to come check us out in person. The Church at the Rock service starts at 9 a.m. and the Legacy service starts at 1115. If you have any prayer requests or want to connect with us, fill out our Connect card. You can find it in the link below. Now, here is the message. Okay, today we're going to talk about a, a very interesting chapter in the Bible, and we're going to get into some like dreams and prophecy stuff in the book of Daniel. Large chunks of the book of Daniel are speaking about prophecy. And so we want to understand some of these things. And so today is going to be a sermon about a dream. Uh, and naturally there'll be interactions. We're going to talk about Nebuchadnezzar and Daniel and all kind of things. But this chapter paints a picture. It paints a picture that starts about 600 years before Jesus comes, and it runs all the way until His second coming. It runs all the way to the book of Revelation. And so this dream that Nebuchadnezzar has in Daniel chapter 2 is a snapshot of how God is going to work through history. And one of the interesting things about this dream is God gave it to Nebuchadnezzar. As we read this dream and see what's happening, you would think, oh, this is something he's going to give to Daniel or Isaiah or Jeremiah or Ezekiel, like these great Old Testament prophets, or maybe somebody like David or Moses or Joshua, you know, men of God that, that served him in profound ways. Nope. Gives it to a pagan king that was an incredibly cruel person. And there's a reason for that. God has a reason behind it. And as we walk through this passage, you're going to see and understand this reason. So this account begins one night in Babylon when Nebuchadnezzar was having trouble sleeping. Look at verse 1. It says, One night during the second year of his reign, Nebuchadnezzar had such disturbing dreams that he couldn't sleep. He called on his magicians, enchanters, sorcerers, and astrologers, and he demanded they tell him what he had dreamed. As he stood before the king, he said, I have had a dream that deeply troubles me. I must know what it means. So it kind of seems like Nebuchadnezzar had one of those, one of those nights that we oftentimes have, right? You can't go to sleep. Right? You have weird dreams. I, I am one of those people that I... I know I dream, but I almost never remember any of my dreams. Is anybody else like that? Like, you don't actually remember the things that you dream. Like, my wife will remember her dreams very vividly. I just, I don't do that. Um, I, very few times in my life do I really remember my dreams. I feel like there was one time in my life when the Lord spoke to me through a dream uh, that I can look back and go, there's no doubt God was speaking to me through that dream. But in this, in this point, that's what God's doing. He's speaking to Nebuchadnezzar through this dream. And it's no wonder Nebuchadnezzar could get a little stressed out from time to time, a little tossing and turning. I mean, he, he was a very powerful man, but he had a lot of weight on his shoulders. He was the absolute monarch for a empire. So you can understand how the pressure would get to him from time to time. He had all of the money and the power and the fame that you could have in that time, but it still couldn't always calm his troubled soul. He was the mightiest man in the world, but on this night he couldn't sleep. So when he wakes up, he remembers his dream, but he doesn't know what it means. So he calls together all of these he calls together all of these different wise men according to him, right? These magicians, these astrologers, these different people. He calls them together and he commands them to tell, the, tell him the dream that he had and the interpretation. I mean, they look at him and they go, well, tell us, tell us the dream and then we'll tell you the interpretation, now, like, that's some old school stuff right there. Like, that, that's how these people work things. That's what they do. Right? The, these kind of charlatan psychics, right? They'll get you to tell them a little something, 
and they'll come up with their, their generalized statements of things that will, uh, will uh, uh, give you some type of comfort and kind of tell you what you want to hear so that they can get your money and that you will come back and give them more of your money, right? I remember years ago, there was this lady that would come on. She had like an infomercial deal in commercials, and she would come on late at night. Her name was Miss Cleo. Anybody remember Miss Cleo? She was this lady that would come on and she would have this 1 900 number. Said, Call Miss Cleo. I'll tell you everything. Miss Cleo, I'm sure, got a lot of money out of folks because she would ask these very, whoever was on the phone would ask these very general questions. And, and then the next thing you know, they had said, she had said some things that kind of gave them some comfort and they called the 1 900 number again and paid $1.99 a minute, whatever it was. Now, that's kind of what they want. But Nebuchadnezzar isn't buying this. Here's what Nebuchadnezzar says. Nope. You tell me the dream and the interpretation. So he's asking them, tell me what I dreamed. But that's a hill to climb right there. He knows. But he won't tell them. So they're trapped. They ask him several times. He refuses. So finally... He's like, that's, that's your final answer? You know, kind of like on the, the old, uh, who wants to be a millionaire, final answer? And they say, yes. And then he has a rather interesting thought process. He says, fine, I'll just kill all of you. So this gives you a little clue into the mind of Nebuchadnezzar. This was not a nice man. Nebuchadnezzar was powerful and Nebuchadnezzar was cruel. To understand that, all you need to go do is read the book of Lamentations in the Bible. It's just a few short chapters. It's not very long. But it's an account of what happened after the Babylonians destroyed Jerusalem and what was left in their wake. Nebuchadnezzar was not a kind fellow. So he decides, well, all these wise men, all these astrologers, all these people that I've trained, all of these folks, I'm just going to kill them. We'll just wipe them out and start over. So here's the interesting thing that happens. Daniel was not there. Daniel was just at his house sitting there. And a guy shows up at his house and says, Hey, i got to kill you. Well, that's a fine way to wake up in the middle of the night. Well, got to kill you. But wait, what? Why? Why are, what has happened? And so the man that comes to Daniel's house explains to Daniel what has happened. And Daniel says, i got to go talk to the king. Now Daniel, if you remember from the last chapter, was considered by Nebuchadnezzar to be an incredibly wise man. He was ten times better than all the other people that had been trained from, from Israel. He was, he was put in high levels of authority. He was an important guy. And so Daniel says, well, you're going to kill me? I don't even know what's going on. I wasn't there. I need to go talk to Nebuchadnezzar. And so he personally asked the king for more time. And then he goes back to his three friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. The four young men that refused to partake of the food that we talked about last week. He goes back to them and he says, we need to pray. We need to ask God to show us what is happening. And in verse 19, Daniel gets the answer. It says, Daniel praised the God of heaven who knows all things and revealed the dream to his servants. That night the secret was revealed to Daniel in a vision. And then Daniel praised the God of heaven. So Nebuchadnezzar wants these other guys to tell him the dream and interpret it. Daniel says, give me a minute. Give me a minute. Let me go to God. Let me go to God. So he goes to God. And God gives him the answer. Now, just this part teaches us some things. This teaches us about the failing of human power. I mean, was Nebuchadnezzar a mighty man? Incredibly so. Nebuchadnezzar was incredibly powerful. There was nobody on the planet Earth that was more powerful than Nebuchadnezzar. He was the king of an incredible empire. His wealth knew no bounds. He was beyond belief in his influence in the world for that period of time. But he was helpless in this. He was helpless to understand his dream. See, money and power 
And worldly success can get you many things. But when it comes to the things of God, what does it really get you? When we're basing our lives and our worth on the things of this world, then all we've got is the things of this world. See, that's why I think God gave Nebuchadnezzar the dream. God wanted to put Nebuchadnezzar in a place where he would finally see for at least a moment, I don't know everything. I'm not in control of everything. My wise men that serve me can't do this. They don't know what's going on. And so God gives the dream to Nebuchadnezzar specifically so Daniel can show him it's all about God. So these wise men, so-called, are debunked. They're nothing. Their pagan religion, their thought process, how they did things, it couldn't produce what the king wanted. Historians tell us that the, the Babylonians wrote all kinds of books about how to um, interpret dreams and all of these things, but they were unable to retrieve the dream itself. See, this shows the futility of human wisdom. See, we may think we know a lot. There's people around us that think they know a lot. right? There's folks that think, I've got all the answers. When our answers come apart from God, we don't have the answers. See, what we've got is what we can come up with. And I don't know about you, but compared to the God of the universe, the living God that created the universe, I don't have a lot going on. Okay? I, am, I am incredibly limited. I can read, I can study, I can try to learn all of science and literature, finance. I can, learn, I can try to learn all kinds of things. Compared to God, I know zero. See, that's what this is teaching us here. The futility of human wisdom. These Babylonians thought, oh, I've got it all. I understand. I know what I'm doing. And God says, do you really? Do you really? And we rely on just ourselves. We only have our abilities. And in this moment, we see the desire of Nebuchadnezzar. How he desperately wants to understand this dream and what it says. What it means. See, he understands this is important. He understands this has been sent to him. But his anger here reveals what's going on, that there's an inner emptiness here. He knows he can't figure this out. There's something missing. There's something he doesn't have. There's something he doesn't know. There's, there's something that's a void in his life, a vacuum. Guys, there's a God-shaped vacuum inside each one of us. And God is trying to get Nebuchadnezzar's attention in this. He's trying to show him, this isn't about you. This is about me. And you've got to reorient your life. I mean, verses 27 and 28 can almost be the, the theme of the entire chapter. Listen to what verses 27 and 28 say. This is Daniel speaking to Nebuchadnezzar. This is Daniel speaking to Nebuchadnezzar. Listen to how he speaks to Nebuchadnezzar. Daniel replied, there are no wise men... Enchanters, magicians, or fortune tellers who can reveal the king's secret. But there is a God in heaven who reveals secrets. And he has shown King Nebuchadnezzar what will happen in the future. Now I will tell you your dream and the visions you saw as you lay in your bed. So human inability is met by God's power. See, here's what you need to understand today. Nothing is impossible with God. If God is who he said he is, if he did create, if he is the God of this universe, if he created the universe whole cloth out of nothing, is there anything he can't do? Is there anything he can't be a part of? Is there anything he can't fix? Let me tell you this morning, you may be sitting here and you may say, my life is a wreck. And you know what? You may be absolutely right. But God can fix it. You may have relationships in your life that are broken, that are absolutely in tatters. God can restore you may be struggling with health problems today. I'm going to tell you what. God is still in the healing business. I fully 100% believe that. I've seen God do things that, that absolutely doctors cannot explain. God's still in that business. Whatever's happening in your life, whatever you're struggling with, it's not impossible with God. I'm going to tell you something. It may be impossible for you. 
your human wisdom, your human thoughts, the way you may want to go about it, you may never get it fixed. But we serve a God that's beyond those things and above those things. We serve a God that is bigger than all those things. And that's what Daniel is telling Nebuchadnezzar. You don't know. Your astrologers and magicians don't know. But let me tell you about a God in heaven that knows. Let me tell you the God I know. So then he begins to tell him the dream. And then he's going to interpret it for him. Look at verse 31. Daniel chapter 2 verse 31. He says, In your vision, your majesty, you saw standing before you a huge shining statue of a man. It was a frightening sight. The head of the statue was made of fine gold. Its chest and arms were silver. Its belly and thighs were bronze. Its legs were iron. And its feet were a combination of iron and baked clay. As you watched, a rock was cut from a mountain, not by, but not by human hands. It struck the feet of iron and clay, smashing them to bits. The whole statue was crushed into small pieces of iron, clay, bronze, silver, and gold. Then the wind blew them away without a trace like chaff on a threshing floor. But the rock that knocked down the statue became a great mountain that covered the whole earth. Okay, y'all get, y'all get all of that? Y'all, 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 I know, you don't even need me to say anything else. Y'all ready to go, all right? So this is a strange dream. So we've got this statue, right? Let's think, about, let's think back through it. Head of gold, chest of silver, belly and thighs are bronze, legs are iron, and feet and toes are iron mixed with clay. And the statue isn't doing anything. It's literally just standing there. So it's got all these different metals in it. That kind of seems to be a a big part of it. And then a stone, a boulder, strikes it at the feet. And it falls over. It shatters. And then all the pieces are blown away by the wind. And only the stone is still there, which becomes a mountain and fills the earth. That's a weird dream, guys. Now, notice this. In this dream, there's a deterioration of the metals, but they strengthen. Gold is the most precious, right? That's the head. Then we go to silver, right? Then we go to bronze. Okay, we've got the Olympics coming up soon. I don't know if any of y'all like the Olympics. I watched some of it, nah, a little bit here and there, right? If you're in first place, you get the what? Gold. If you're in second place, you get silver. And then third place, you get bronze. And then now the legs are iron. And then at the bottom is this iron mixed with clay. That doesn't sound very stable, does it? So the key to understanding this is in verse 38. Listen to verse 38. He says, Daniel says to Nebuchadnezzar, He has made you the ruler over all the inhabited world and has put even the wild animals and birds under under your control. You are the head of gold. So... Nebuchadnezzar's the head of gold. That sounds pretty good. But what about the rest of it? Listen to verse 39. But after your kingdom comes to an end, another kingdom inferior to yours will rise to take your place. After that kingdom has fallen, a third kingdom represented by bronze will rise to rule the world. Following that kingdom, there will be a fourth one as strong as iron. That kingdom will smash and crush all previous empires just as iron smashes and crushes everything it strikes. So, This is a bit of a history lesson. Now, if you like history, you may pick up really quick on what's happening here and where Daniel is headed. Because we're going to have a succession of empires. First, you had gold, Babylon. Second was silver. Who replaced the Babylonians as the great empire of the world in that area? The Persians. Who replaced the Persians? The Greeks. Alexander the Great, right? Alexander sat on his throne and wept, for there were no more worlds to conquer. He had conquered everything before him. Who replaced Alexander the Great? The Romans. So we had this succession across history. The head, the gold is Babylon. The silver is the Persians. The bronze is the Greeks. And the legs of iron are the Romans. Now, verses 41 through 43 are interesting. They explain that the feet and toes are made partly of iron and partly of clay. Now that's weird. Do iron and clay go together to form something that would be a sturdy structure? No. It doesn't. It doesn't. So most biblical scholars, most theologians, they think that this refers to the breakup of the Roman Empire 
into all the countries that now make up what we think of as the Western world. Europe, the Mediterranean, even the United States fits into this. Because we're, our culture is really descended from that Greek and Roman culture, right? That, that, that sprang up in, in Europe after the fall of the Roman Empire. And note that when the stone hits the statue, it doesn't hit the head, the chest, the thighs, or the legs. It strikes the feet. Now, who is the stone? Who is the stone? We've established who all of the different pieces are. The Babylonians, the Persians, the Greeks, the Romans, and then down to kind of us. The stone is Christ. The stone is Christ. Christ comes in when He returns. When we think about like the book of Revelation. When He returns to establish His kingdom, He will smash every government of mankind. When Christ returns... Everything else is replaced. Right? In the dream, not only did the stone smash the statue, all the pieces were blown away. They're described as blowing away like chaff. Right? When they would separate the wheat from the chaff. It's all blown away. It's all gone. Christ's coming brings an end to everything that was built by mankind. If man built it, it's coming down. Every building, every monument, every stadium, every house... Everything that we build, right? Everything that we build with bloated man's bloated ego. And then Jesus established his kingdom. Now listen to verse 44 about the kingdom that's coming. He says there, During the reigns of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed or conquered. It will crush all these kingdoms into nothingness and it will stand forever. Folks, you're a Christian today. That should be like, yes, that is what we're looking for. Because I don't know if you realize it or not, but this world is a hot wreck. Any, I mean, do we agree? You watch the news lately? Things are kind of a hot wreck. But what we see here is God is saying through this dream to the prophet Daniel, there's going to come a day when I'm going to take care of all this. I'm going to fix it. I'm going to put it back in place. I'm going to stand it up. And when I put my kingdom in place, it is forever. And if you're a child of God today, you are part of that kingdom. The Bible says that we are co-heirs with Christ. John chapter 1 tells us that we are children of God if we know Jesus Christ. So we have his kingdom. So nothing of this world should scare me. Nothing should scare me. Because at the end of the day, my Father wins. My Heavenly Father wins. The bad stuff that you're struggling with right now, at the end of the day, God wins. The illness, God wins. The struggles, God wins. The money problems, God wins. God wins in all of it. See, that? Who God's going to put something in place that's going to be eternal. That's going to be forever. That's going to be right. It's not made by human hands. See, this, this is the final rebuke of what we think of as, as humanism, human secularism. That man thinks, I can build it and it will last, it will stand, we've got it. When Christ sets up his kingdom, he doesn't need help from you or me. He says, come on in, I have prepared a place for you. See, that's what's happening. And his kingdom will smash all these other things. See, there's a day of judgment that's coming. There's a day that's coming and it's talked about when every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. Folks, we will bow that knee willingly or it will be bowed for us. Now, let me tell you something this morning. If you're in here and you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, let me tell you this morning. I I want you to know Him because I want you to be a part of this kingdom. I want you to be a child of God and I want you to bow that knee willingly and say, You are my Lord. Because... The other option on that is not real good. Because it's separation from God for eternity in a place called hell. When we reject God, God says, okay, I honor your wishes. You see, God doesn't really send us to hell. We send ourselves by rejecting Him. He makes that offer to all of us. For God so loved the world, He sings His only God and Son, that whosoever believes in Him shall not perish but have everlasting life. It's open to all of us. But when we reject Him, in our free will, He honors our rejection. So, it is eternal. 
His kingdom is not made by human hands. It will replace all things, and it is forever. It is the final kingdom. He will never be replaced. No one will overthrow him. No one will come into his throne room. He is God. So, what do we take from this today? What do we walk out of here and do? Now, I always think about that. When I'm thinking about a passage of Scripture... One of the things I want to go back to is this. What do I do with this, right? Like, it's great to have this information, right? It's great to understand, okay, well, we got the golds, the Babylonians, the silvers, the Persians, the, the Greeks are the bronze, the, the iron is the Romans, and then the clay and iron mixed together. Well, that's kind of us here in the Western world. That's us. Here we are. But what do I do with that tomorrow morning? Right? That's good information, and how incredible it is that God laid all that out. But what do I do? I think one of the things for us to go back to and understand is we're not in control. And understand that history is not determined by kings or prime ministers or presidents, but by the hand of God himself. See, these great leaders, they always think they're calling the shots. Nebuchadnezzar thought he was the man. Alexander the Great thought he was the man. Roman emperor after Roman emperor, they thought they were in control. All the way down to us today with our elected officials. They all think the same thing. But here is what we need to understand. The bigger they come, the harder they fall. See, this statue in Daniel chapter 2 teaches us that it is God that's in the control of the flow of history, not us. Not us. God will use even our dumb decisions. God will use even the things that we do to bring about through the flow of history what He wants because He knew what we were going to do anyway. You see, I don't have to concern myself with all the things that's happening around me all the time and get myself upset, worked up, nervous, all in a tizzy about it. Because you know what? God is in control. I can relax in that. See, that's something this passage ought to do for you. It ought to help you relax a little bit. Because it shows you that God has placed these kingdoms where they are and God will take them out when He is ready. And when He is ready, He will establish His kingdom. I can relax in that. All right, everybody's in a tizzy right now in this country, aren't we? Y'all watch the news lately? It's a little tense out there, right? We got some kind of election coming up in a couple of months. Y'all heard about it? Right? Everybody, everybody's losing their mind flipping out on all sides, right? Doesn't matter who you like, who you vote for, whatever. Everybody's flipping out. Here's what I need to tell you today. That it's important to participate. Go vote. But let's not forget that God works in, with, and through our decisions to see that His will is done. He's in control. Whatever happens anywhere else in the world around me, God's the one in charge at the end of the day. And as a Christian, that brings you peace. Maybe the person you like wins, maybe the person you don't like wins. But the person that loves you above all things, God, the God of this universe, who created you in His image, at the end of the day, He's the one really in charge. Praise God. Like So, next time you watch a news story that flips you out and freaks you out, and you're like, what's, what? what's going on? And we're all in a tizzy. Sit down and take a breath. And understand, God's got it. Do your part. Participate. Line yourself up with the Word of God to the best of your ability. But understand, He's in control. Because nothing happens by accident. See, Nebuchadnezzar, he was a brilliant military mind. He was a very volatile and cruel man. He had little regard for human life, as you can see from the start of this chapter. But yet God used even him. Daniel chapter 2 reminds us that God is standing in the shadows of all these things, working out His plans, even in the most difficult and darkest of moments. And everything except God's kingdom is temporary. Look, when, when death knocks, the world has no answer. When death comes and takes away a person, being in the prime of their life, 
Maybe they've lived to be 105. People without Christ, they don't know what to say or what to do. See, when we, when, when we don't have that relationship with God, death reveals the emptiness and the void of everything else. What is there? But the fact is that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Without Him, there is no going. Without Him, there is no knowing. Without Him, there is no living. See, life by itself is a losing game. You know how the world rewards you when you die? You get a hole in the ground and a piece of stone above your head. They put your name on it. They put your date of birth and your date of death. And you know how they sum up your life? The dash in the middle. That's it. That's all the world gives you. You're famous, you get a dash. Live to be 105, a dash. You die young, a dash. You're a good person, a dash. Criminal, a dash. So it doesn't matter if you're rich, poor, old, young, nice, a jerk, a rock star. It doesn't matter who you are, it's all the same. And then life moves on. But God has something else. Listen to the book of Hebrews. Hebrews 11.10. speaks about Abraham. It says, Abraham was confidently looking forward to a city with eternal foundations. A city designed and built by God. See, that same chapter tells us that people of faith, we are aliens and strangers on this earth. See, Abraham was looking forward to what God was going to build. Are we looking forward to God's kingdom? Or are we caught up in all the things that this world has to offer? What are we caught up in? What's important to us? What, is it, what, is, what, are, what are we doing with that dash? Right? Okay, I've got the year I was born. 1976. Right? December 26th. My birthday. 1976. I'm still in that dash. God hasn't called me home yet. What are you doing with the dash? What are you doing in this world that's going to actually leave a mark? What are you doing in this world that's going to matter in the kingdom of God? See, all, all of that other stuff, I mean, all the, the, the stuff, the money, the power, the land, the buildings. I mean, what, what does it all really matter? There's a few people here and there that, you know, somebody like Nebuchadnezzar that he didn't know God. We still talk about him a few thousand years later. But boy, is Nebuchadnezzar the exception. For the vast majority of us, this world just forgets us. But what we do for the kingdom of God lasts forever. See, a life lived for God, helping change the world, leading someone to Christ, helping the hurting, taking care of those in need. Folks, that's a dash worth having. See, that's what our life is supposed to be being built on and based around. See, what we have to understand is that we don't build our lives. Don't build your life around the things of this world. Don't build your life around the things of this world. Because that's going to leave you a dash that doesn't last. Because when that statue gets blown over, when Jesus comes back, all that stuff, that's what's called wood, hay, and stubble. That burns up real quick. But a life lived for God matters. Because, see, at the end of the day, God is the center of history. Jesus is the center of history. See, everything that happened in Genesis, all the way up to the start of the book of Matthew, was leading us towards Christ. Then we have the Gospels. We have Jesus here. Then when He returns to heaven, everything after that is pointing us back towards another thing. His second coming. And His second coming brings history to fulfillment. Everything was leading up to Him, and now everything is leading up to Him coming again. Which leads me to say that you can know all the facts of history, but if you don't know Jesus, you miss the point. So the question that you have to ask yourself this morning is what is your relationship to the rock of salvation? What is your relationship to the Lord Jesus Christ? What is it? Who is He? What is He doing in your life? What are you doing with the dash? How is it reflecting God? When He comes, we'd be glad to see Him. Or you discover that He destroyed all the things that you worked so hard to build. He knocked them over and they were like chaff blown away. That's a challenge. See, if we spend our days just building for this world, we discover that all we have done counts for nothing at the end of the day. 
But if we're using that dash that we've got for eternity, when Christ comes, we celebrate because we lived a life that mattered. The world is better for us having been here because we helped further the kingdom of God. There's an old phrase that goes back a long way, and it goes like this. I only have one life, and it will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. See, Nebuchadnezzar built this massive kingdom. His capital was Babylon. It was the greatest city in the world. You know what Babylon is today? Rubble. There's nothing there. It's empty. Nebuchadnezzar built a great kingdom that in one night, God destroys. He spent his life, he spent his dash to build an empire, and God took it like that. What are you building your life on? How are you using the dash? When Christ's kingdom is established, what will your life have been spent building? Let's pray. Father, I thank you so much for this passage, for this dream that you gave Nebuchadnezzar and that you have shared with us through the prophet Daniel. And Lord, I pray that each one of us, Lord, we stop and consider what are we building? Nebuchadnezzar spent his life building an empire that no longer exists. But Lord, we can build your kingdom. Lord, we can serve you. We can follow you. We can know you. So God, my prayer for each person in this room, Lord, is that we use our lives well. And that we strive to build things that will last. To impact people's hearts and lives for the gospel. To love those that you've called us to love. To love our neighbor as ourselves. To be the hands and feet. Lord, let our lives change the world one life at a time. In your holy name we pray. Amen. But we love you guys. We're so glad that you've been here this morning. So as you leave this morning, I challenge you to do something I talk about all the time. Use your dash well. Go out tomorrow and do the next right thing. We'll see you next week.